session gets over also. And with immense pleasure, I would like to invite and welcome the next speaker, Dr. Vishal Punya. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics, AJMU, and is currently pursuing DNB nephrology from RML Lucknow. Over to you, sir, and very warm welcome. Respected Honorable VC, sir, respected HOD, Dr. Shelly, ma'am, all the respected faculty members and my dear colleagues, uh, a very good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and the respected HOD, ma'am, to give me this opportunity. And, uh, the topic which I have chosen for today's presentation is the acute kidney injury in the PICU. So first of all, why I chose this topic? So I chose it because uh, acute kidney injury is commonly seen in hospitalized children throughout the world, including India. And uh, within the past two decades, the AKI has, uh, epidemiology of the pediatric AKI has uh, expanded. And there has been evolution of renal replacement therapies and it has illustrated beneficial outcomes in terms of reducing mortality and death of hospital stay. Coming to the epidemiology of AKI, if we look at the global epidemiology, the uh, global epidemiology of pediatric AKI has increased. And this increase has been due to uh, the availability of standardized AKI definitions, which were lacking, say, about 14 years ago, 14, 15 years ago. There were no standardized definitions. Uh, and uh, availability of reliable AKI defining biomarkers and formation of national registries and various multinational studies. Looking at the global epidemiology, uh, this was a multinational study which uh, looked at uh, AKI in PICUs in 4,683 patients. And uh, it found that the incidence of AKI was 26.9% and severe AKI occurred in 11.6% of the patients. And and mortality was 11% with the development of severe AKI. Uh, in a meta-analysis, the total incidence of pediatric AKI was 18.7% and incidence of AKI in critically ill or high-risk children was almost one-fourth of them developed AKI. And there was seven times higher odds of mortality in comparison to those who uh, did not have AKI. And 13% required renal replacement therapy. If we look at the Indian scenario, various studies have been performed uh, in AKI in children in India, and uh, they have uh, reported the incidence of AKI ranging from 14% up to 36%, with a mortality uh, ranging from 28.5% to 46.3%. So the incidence is also high, and it also leads to increased mortality. Coming to the pathophysiology of AKI, the pathophysiology may involve all the compartments of the kidney, including the glomerulus, vessels, interstitium, tubules, everything can be involved. So uh, in the vessels, there is an uh, increase in the vasoconstrictive factors like the um, sympathetic stimulation, increased adenosine, increased angiotensin 2, thromboxane A2, endothelium, leukotrienes, and there is deficiency of various vasodilator uh, uh, factors like acetylcholine, bradykinin, nitric oxide, prostaglandin E2. Apart from that, there may be endothelial and smooth muscle cell damage leading to increased leukocyte endothelial adhesion, vascular obstruction, various inflammatory markers like cytokines and reactive oxygen species are involved. Uh, in the tubules, the, there is cytoskeletal breakdown and loss of polarity of the tubular cells. There is loss of these microvilli in the tubules and further leading to apoptosis and necrosis of the tubular cells. And uh, then the, these cells are lost from the tubules. So, this, uh, so all the compartments can be involved. This is the whole spectrum of AKI which starts from the normal kidney and then after uh, uh, because of any illness, the patient is at risk of AKI. The risk factors may be various exposures like presence of sepsis, critical illness, burns, trauma, cardiac surgeries, major non-cardiac surgeries, or exposure to nephrotoxic drugs. 
there can be various susceptibilities in the host itself like volume depletion maybe because of diarrhea or bleeding female gender african american race is especially uh, prone to develop aki presence of underlying chronic kidney disease or any other chronic illness like patients with cld with massive ascites may develop uh, hepatorenal syndrome or underlying chronic cardiac disease presence of cancer anemia and diabetes may like this so if the, if we do not recognize the patient at these uh, with the presence of these risk factors and the risk factors persist they go on to develop kidney damage and after the damage there is reduction in gfr here comes the role of various biomarkers which i shall talk about about later and uh, uh, further after the fall in gfr the kidney fails and ultimately leading to death if aggregate is not provided various definitions provided by uh, provided for the aki include the pediatric rifle definition uh, rifle stands for r is risk i is injury f is failure l is loss and e is end stage and it is defined according to the estimated creatinine clearance and urine output so risk is decrease in creatinine clearance by 25% or urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 8 hours injury is decrease in estimated creatinine clearance by 50% or urine output less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 16 hours failure is uh, decreased creatinine clearance by 75% or a creatinine clearance below 35 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square this is exclusively for children or urine output below 0.3 ml per kg per hour for 24 hours or anuretic for 12 hours loss is loss of renal function for a duration more than 3 weeks and end stage is uh, for more than 3 months another deficient definition is the uh, kedigo definition which uh, defines three stages of aki according to serum creatinine and urine output stage 1 is serum increase in serum creatinine uh, 1.5 to 1.9 times of baseline or an increase of more than 0.3 mg per deciliter uh, stage 2 is uh, serum creatinine 2 to 2.9 times of baseline and stage 3 is serum creatinine 3 times baseline or an absolute value of serum creatinine more than 4 mg per deciliter if a patient is initiated on rrt he directly comes to stage 3 or there is a fall in gfr below 35 and these are the urine output criteria the third uh, classification criteria is the uh, acute kidney injury network akin criteria which also defines three stages of aki for serum creatinine and urine output uh, so stage 1 is increased by 0.3 mg per deciliter within 48 hours or a 150 to 200% increase from baseline or uh, stage 2 is 200 to 300% increase from baseline or at stage 3 is more than 300% increase from baseline in serum creatinine or an absolute value of a 4 or an acute rise of more than 0.5 mg per deciliter and these are the various urine output criteria then comes the role of biomarkers the biomarkers are certain markers which help us to identify uh, the presence of uh, acute kidney injury as well as to follow the prognosis they are the crucial tools for diagnostic and elevation in levels has shown association with mortality increased length of stay in icu and need for renal replacement therapy so the conventional biomarkers include serum creatinine and urine output and all our current definitions of aki are based on these both but both have significant limitations in children and they can be misleading Uh, like serum creatinine is only detectable hours or days after kidney injury and can be influenced by muscle mass fluid balance and uh, concomitant medications so if we uh, detect an increase in serum creatinine today that means the creatinine uh, the kidney injury has already developed for maybe one two or three days earlier uh, then urine output may be affected by the hydration status and use of diuretics so that's why we need some new biomarkers these are the basic biomarkers which are uh, which have been studied these include neutrophil gelatinase associated lipogallin or ngal cystatin c kidney injury molecule 1 il18 liver type fatty acid binding protein and tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase 2 and insulin like growth factor binding protein 7 out of these they have been the most studied ones now there have been some uh recent uh, advances in aki and there have been some tools for early diagnosis of aki or even uh, identifying children who may develop aki in future 
So one of the uh, first of these tools is the renal angina index, and it is proposed for the prediction of critically ill patients at high risk of developing severe ATI. It combines various markers of kidney dysfunction and various patient characteristics, and a renal angina index of eight or above within the first twelve hours of admission has a very high sensitivity and negative predictive value for ATI development. And RAI of more than eight was shown to be associated with increased uh, requirement of uh, kidney replacement therapy, prolonged ventilation, and a higher risk of mortality. This index has been validated in Indian children also. There have been studies from uh, uh, Lady Harding Medical College, Ames, New Delhi, which have validated this index in Indian children also. This is the these are the components of uh, renal angina index include. Uh, the AKI risk strata and the clinical injury signs. Uh, so uh, the moderate risk or uh, admission to PICU is a score one. History of bone marrow or solid organ transplant is a score three. And present uh, mechanical ventilation and inotropes is score five. Clinical injury signs include less than five percent fluid overload or no change in creatinine clearance. Uh, five to ten percent fluid overload or decrease in creatinine clearance by up to twenty four percent is score. Fluid overload or uh, decrease in creatinine clearance by 25 to 49 percent. This is code four, and 15 percent or more of fluid overload or decrease in creatinine clearance uh, by 50 percent or more. This is code eight. The second tool is the renal functional reserve test. It evaluates the difference between maximum GFR and the baseline GFR. Uh, a preoperative renal functional reserve. Has been shown to predict the development of AKI in children, and patients with AKI had a lower renal functional reserve that was 15.57 ml per minute in comparison to those without AKI who had a functional reserve of 27 ml per minute. And patients with preoperative RFR less than 15, there the risk of AKI is uh, increased by around 12 folds, and so this can identify individuals who are at risk of AKI development. Then there is a fluzomide stress test in which IV fluzomide is administered at 1 to 1.5 mg per kg to identify patients at risk of progression to stage 3 AKI. Fluzomide induces an increase in urine output which allows for assessment of tubular function because the site of action of fluzomide is the thick ascending limb. So it estimates the tubular function. Critically ill patients with kidney or stage one or stage two AKI who were subjected to fluzomide stress test showed that the two-hour urine output after giving fluzomide effectively predicted progression to stage three AKI within the ensuing 14 days. It is a simple tool and a crucial predictor of individuals with high risk of severe AKI. So, coming to management of AKI in PICU, so uh, these are the various. Uh, aspects of management the first is that we should i try to identify the underlying cause and treat it second is the management of fluid status the management of electrolyte status nutritional support adjustment of drugs and renal replacement therapy if indicated and specific pharmacological therapies first of all is the cause of aki we should uh, try hard to identify the cause Uh, we should ask about any recent medical or surgical procedures, consumption of drugs in the past few days, which may include some nephrotoxic drugs. We should assess the volume status and the cardiac output, and we should uh, uh, the hemodynamic dynamic monitoring, if feasible, should be performed. Uh, fractional excretion of sodium may be measured, which may help us to uh, differentiate pre-renal from the renal AKI. And uh, urine examination is helpful in uh, determining the cause of AKI. Ultrasonography to look for the kidneys, any signs of obstruction, the kidney size, any malformations of the kidney, any structural anomalies, and ultimately a kidney biopsy may be performed if the cause of AKI is not clear by non-invasive methods. After identifying the cause, we should make every effort to remove or correct the underlying cause. Like if the patient is taking nephrotoxic drugs, NSAIDs, AC inhibitors, ARBs, any calcineurin inhibitors, diuretics, amino glycosides, they may be stopped. Uh, then there is this Ninja project, which is which is uh, um, negating uh, the renal injury by just-in-time action, 
and uh, this has shown uh, this is uh, in the ninja project it is an electronic monitoring of the health records of the patient and the, uh, the children who are taking three or more nephrotoxic medications on the same day or who have received iv aminoglycosides for three or more consecutive days are identified electronically and then their serum creatinine is monitored daily so after this ninja project project was applied to a single center it was seen that there was a 62% reduction in the nephrotoxic medication aki rate and uh, after the multi center application of this ninja project it was successful in preventing nephrotoxin medication induced aki the non diuretic management of aki via fluke therapy has been shown to be effective initial management consists of isotonic crystallides uh, instead of colloids like albumin and uh, there has been comparison of uh, crystalloids versus colloids like this chest trial which compared crystalloid with hydroxyethyl starch and it reported a higher risk of requirement of renal replacement therapy in patients who received colloids in comparison to crystalloids so crystalloids is the first choice we should uh, not rush to use colloids Uh, regarding albumin versus saline albumin is also an colloid there was no difference in aki or need for rrt in hypovolemic adult icu patients on use of albumin as compared to use of saline but albumin was found to be beneficial in a subset of patients who had sepsis or burns so it can be useful in specific situations but in general albumin is not preferred over saline Uh, then bolus fluids may should be used, but they should be used carefully. It may be harmful in certain patients. In a in a, like this fast trial, which was performed in African children, uh, where the administration of saline, saline or albumin leads to increased mortality with uh, in African children with severe sepsis in comparison to patients with no boluses. Then certain other drugs like adenosine receptor antagonists like theophylline have been suggested for uh, neonatal AKI, especially the asphyxi asphyxiated neonates who are at high risk of AKI. Uh, they can reduce feedback mediated vasoconstriction, increase renal blood flow, and restore GFR in AKI patients. Then the other pharmacological agents like renal dose dopamine, which is uh, uh, rather commonly talked about, there has been no benefit. of renal dose dopamine in adults in preventing or treating aki and but it has not been adequately studied in children so it is not recommended at present other drugs including norepinephrine uh, like uh, the first speaker told norepinephrine improves splanchnic splanchnic blood flow renal perfusion and urine output by maximizing cardiac output and vascular tone and it may avoid need for rrt so like uh, in children who are in shock Uh, who have a poor perfusion norepinephrine may be used norepinephrine is also helpful in uh, hepatorenal syndrome uh, then uh, nasiratide uh, which is a uh, which acts on uh, atrial inactivated uh, natriuretic peptide receptors and phenyldopam which is a dopamine receptor agonist uh, they have also been tried in uh, prevention or treatment of aki but the, there is no evidence at present in children so not recommended then use of diuretics diuretics may convert an oliguric aki into a non oliguric aki they augment urine output but they do not enhance solute clearance uh, the uh, giving diuretics by infusion has the benefit that same increase in urine output can be produced with less cumulative exposure to diuretic uh, they optimize fluid overload they decrease pico stay and they may decrease the requirement of ventilation so they can be used for the treatment of fluid overload but not for the treatment of aki pass nutrition is very important nutrition has been shown to improve outcomes enteral nutrition is always better than parenteral nutrition uh, then use of adult based commercially available formulas may provide high calories with either high or low protein and uh, all of these formulas generally provide 2 calories per ml uh, uh, energy but they are hyperosmolar their osmolarity is around 600 milli osmoles so tolerance of feeds may be a problem but whenever the child can tolerate these formulas can be used they provide high calories in a small volume 
then certain children with AKI may have marked catabolism, so aggressive nutritional support becomes important. Optimal nutritional requirements and nutrient intake composition in AKI remain uncertain and are based largely on expert opinions. Uh, the caloric intake of approximately 30% above maintenance is required. In critically ill children, there is increased protein catabolism. And in addition, if the child is on dialysis, there may be additional losses of amino acids through the dialyzer. And uh, when uh, the child is on standard intake of around 1.5 gram per kg of protein. So in these situations, the child may require a higher protein intake, maybe up to 3 grams per kg per day. Coming to the dialytic treatment of AKI, the various indications of dialysis include presence of anemia, generally a blood urea and nitrogen level of 80 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, presence of volume overload, that is fluid overload more than 10% of body weight, presence of metabolic acidosis, presence of hyperkalemia and pulmonary edema, which are refractory to medical management. Various modalities of uh, renal replacement therapy which are available include intermittent hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy or slow, low efficiency dialysis and continuous renal, renal replacement therapy. So sorry to interrupt sir, can we wind up in five minutes like? Yes, 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 sure. Uh, choice, of uh, choice of therapy depends on the clinical status, expertise, and the availability of resources. HD requires central venous access, uh, specialized equipment, and the expertise, but it, the advantage is that the metabolic abnormalities are corrected rapidly. ED has an advantage that it can be easily performed without, without the use of special uh, equipment, personnel, or anticoagulation. And CRRT is beneficial in hemodynamically unstable children. Coming to prognosis and outcome, AKI as has been shown in various studies as a high mortality, maybe up to 25 to 50%. The risk factors include uh, infants, multi-organ failure, or those receiving renal replacement therapy. Long-term follow-up is necessary based on long-term morbidity. And generally, these children, uh, all children who have developed a moderate to severe AKI, that is a stage two and above, and those who received RRT should be followed at least annually for five years. And if during this time there is any evidence of presence of chronic kidney disease, they should be uh, followed up until adulthood or lifetime. So take home messages from uh, my presentation are that AKI is common in PICU, it increases morbidity and mortality. Early recognition of at-risk children is important. We can use various tools like renal engine S4, uh, the functional reserve. Ninja program is an important tool to prevent nephrotoxin-associated uh, AKI. Uh, biomarkers are being evaluated and in near future, they may become an important tool in recognition and management of AKI. Uh, all efforts should be made to identify and treat the cause. Food balance should be looked at. Electrolytes should be managed. Nutritional support should be provided uh, aggressively. Renal replacement therapy should be started wherever indicated. And proper follow-up is mandatory. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir, for making us aware of the recent advances in pediatric acute kidney injury, a very frequently encountered complication in our ICUs. I would now like to request you, sir, if you could uh, take up the queries in the chat box. So uh, Sherry Ma'am has asked that uh, can Ninja project be applied in our PICU? Yes. Uh, actually, the Ninja project, uh, what is described is that it is uh, the all the health records are monitored electronically. And uh, uh, whenever the child is like on simultaneously is taking free nephrotoxic medications or uh, on amino glycosides, then uh, a flag is raised that child is recognized and is monitored for development of API. So, uh, but that can be done manually also. I think that I believe that that can be done manually. The records, uh, a protocol can be made where the all the charts, the treatment charts are uh, daily scrutinized for the presence of nephrotoxic medications, and the high risk children may be monitored. Yes, uh, I think that can be applied. I'm sorry, I'm unable to get your voice, Dr. Pita. Okay, uh, so the next question, sir, uh, about frosamide stress test. 
the duration of infusion, uh, the type of fluid, and on whom to use it. Frusamide uh, stress test, uh, we give a dose of frusamide, 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kg. It is not necessary in infusion. It can be just given a slow IV bolus. Uh, fluids not required for doing a frusamide stress test. The only thing is uh, to be seen is that the child should not be in shock or should not be volume depleted. Uh, otherwise, we can just give a dose of frusamide and over the next uh, two hours, uh, if the urine output is augmented, that means uh, the child, uh, the tubular function is intact. Otherwise, if the frusamide does not augment the urine output, that means the tubular function is uh, not good. And uh, we can use it in uh, children whom we, uh, whom we uh, find that they can be at a high risk of development of AKI. Uh, like uh, in children who have undergone a cardiac surgery, cardiac bypass surgery, or, uh, or any other major surgery, or uh, who have received, uh, like uh, they are going for a um, contrast study, contrast radiologic study. So uh, they can be subjected to this test. It is just to identify the reserve, the tubular function. How is the tubular function? Right. Sir. Very well said. So, uh, what is the? Uh, there's another query. Oh, that what is the what difference? Is the difference between EGFR and creatinine clearance. Uh, uh, creatinine, creatinine clearance uh, is the uh, like if we go by definition. It is the amount of plasma that is completely cleared of uh, creatinine in a unit time. So uh, that is the creatinine clearance. And the formula is uh, UV by P. That the U is the urine volume. Uh, U is the urinary concentration of creatinine. P is the volume. And P is the plasma concentration of creatinine. That's how we calculate the creatinine clearance. And it is uh, gold standard is the inulin clearance, which is the which gives us the uh, uh, sorry, uh, creatinine clearance and GFR is the measure of the uh, the filtration but which is occurring at the glomerulus and it is measured by the inulin clearance. Uh, the gold standard is the inulin clearance that is the measured GFR. Now here the question is EGFR. EGFR is the estimated GFR. Now for estimating the GFR various equations are available which can uh, estimate the GFR based on various markers. Like there are equations uh, available uh, which use serum creatinine. There are equations available which use cystatin C. And there are equations available which use both creatinine and cystatin C. So that's how we estimate the GFR. Uh, so there is difference between measured GFR and estimated GFR. And uh, sir, uh, next question is, can the both be interchanged? So actually, uh, truly speaking, interchange uh, uh, creatinine clearance and GFR, there is a difference. If we measure GFR by creatinine clearance, there will be a slight overestimation of GFR because creatinine is filtered as well as secreted from the tubules. So there will be a uh, there will be an overestimation of GFR if we measure it by creatinine clearance. But uh, uh, for uh, dosing the drugs in children, the use of creatinine clearance is recommended, uh, which is also not the measured creatinine clearance, rather the estimated creatinine clearance by the Schwartz formula. That should be used to uh, adjust the dosing of drugs in children. Thank you so much, sir. I think we have answered all the queries. And once again, I want to thank you all, uh, all the respected speakers and the respected audience for taking out time and joining us in this pediatrics webinar, uh, an idea conceived by our HOD. And I would like to thank one and all for joining us today and making our efforts really worthwhile. With this, we come to the end of day one of our pediatrics webinar week. And I would like to remind you all that uh, tomorrow we have uh, neonatology as a subspeciality with a series of interesting lectures lined up. Uh, so I would like to request all of you to join us tomorrow again, same time, 1 p.m. Thank you so much. Thank a final you. word from Shelly, ma'am. No, thank you very much, Dr. Alpita. Thank you very much to Dr. Neeraj Anand. He is our latest joinee. 
and he's done a good job. Siddharth is a veteran. He did an excellent job as a veteran. And I'm so glad to see Dr. Vishal Punya coming back to our folds. Welcome, Vishal. And we look forward to your inputs as we have day-to-day -day issues in the PICU. If you agree, then in a, we can discuss how you can advise us on management of patients while you are still not there. So I hope you all had an interesting time. I request all the people who are here today to spread the word, join early, because I think we'll have more people tomorrow. 100 is the limit we are, we can have 100 people in our Zoom link. So today the maximum was 80. I was very happy to see that, but we could have 20 more. So tomorrow we want full 100 capacity. And anytime you, we all are a family. So if there are queries, you can write your queries to Dr. Arpita. And Dr. Arpita will direct it to the faculty concerned and the faculty concerned will respond to you, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank yeah. you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So we are ending the session for today and I would look forward for your kind presence tomorrow also. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you, Arpita. Thank you. Please have one. Well, kids.